Our second passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Again, listen for the word of the Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid her hand, his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When Jesus had said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, my friends in the Presbyterian Church in Sudbury, grace and peace be with you. It is so good, good to be with you. And I am so grateful for uh, the miracle of technology that allows me to be in my home in Wilmington, Delaware, and still join you in worship. It was a hard road to get here, one we would not ever, ever have chosen. But I'm, I'm grateful for the ways we and our churches, and this morning you especially, have leaned into what opened up for us so that we may worship across time and space and the spirit may move even further. Ah. And it's good to see uh, the faces of friends I recognize. So this morning's passages weave together in, in my heart in amazing ways. And we're going to begin with the gospel passage, with the story of the woman crippled by a spirit for 18 long years. And I'm going to invite you to to imagine with me for a little bit. If closing your eyes helps, if being comfortable in your seat helps, I want us to imagine what a heavy spirit that could cripple a person in body and soul might be and might feel like. Some of us may have had experiences where the worries in our lives felt like a weight pressing us down, indeed bending us over, pulling us forward so that we felt like we could not stand up straight like the woman in this story. Perhaps, perhaps we've experienced a medical crisis and both the physical impact of such a crisis, but then also the financial impact which can go on for years and years. The impact of not being able to pay those horrendous, enormous bills, of, of feeling the debt pile up like weight, like rocks being placed on our backs until, yes, indeed, the spirit of that uncertainty and burden and pain and pressure are like a spirit bending us over. Perhaps we have felt the uncertainty of job loss, 
sudden or unexpected or a job loss maybe we were anticipating, but there's nothing, there's nothing else. Or what might be around the corner isn't the same, isn't sufficient. And so the, the pressure, the burden, the yoke in Isaiah's words of uncertain finances, of not knowing how to meet rent or mortgage, electricity, oil for heat, gas, of not being able to stay on top of things like insurance or car payments or transportation expenses. And so the burden, the, the boulders pile up. Can you feel that in your bodies? That spirit that leads to a crippling where our world narrows down into trying to get by day by day to trying simply to survive with no, no thought of thriving, no thought of abundance. Sometimes that burden that bends us down may be dreams that can never be realized, hopes for a future that seem so far out of reach that we know they will just die, they'll wither and die on the vine. And the, the buildup of all those dreams unrealized, all those possibilities nipped in the bud before they could bloom becomes its own staggering weight. Can you feel that in your body? Can you feel how it becomes hard to take a deep breath? Can you feel how your shoulders roll in, how your, how your stomach shrivels up into a hard knot, how your heart beats faster? And imagine that, that spirit, that burden, that weight for 18 years or for your whole life. And for those of us who've never felt that kind of crushing burden, for those of us who have never been bowed under problems and stresses that we just know we don't have the resources to meet. I invite us to take a moment and be aware how very, very blessed we are. How very blessed we are never to have been bowed down because of things that we could not deal with. In our country, in the United States of America, and in our church, the Presbyterian Church USA, we have identified two particular spirits that bow people down for generations, not just 18 years, not just 18 generations, but generation upon generation upon generation. And so if, if the crippling, punishing burden of a few months or years is what we can relate to. Just imagine, just imagine the weight, the yoke of the legacy of slavery in this country, the legacy of generational poverty. These are spirits that bow down children, men, women, siblings, who are all beloved children of God. So when the woman enters the synagogue, when Jesus is speaking and he sees her, he knows that it is a spirit that has crippled her. It's not something she could go to a doctor to be healed of. It's not something she could shrug off and just take, take a day or two and 
rest and then she'll be on her feet. No, it is a spirit. It is, it is a reality that is beyond who she is, that is made up of all that is in her context. And Jesus speaks healing. And she stands. Whatever that spirit was, whether it was poverty or lack of family resources, whether it was being isolated from the community because of her visibly suffering status, the spirit that has bent her over is lifted and she stands up straight. Her lungs can fill with air for the first time in 18 years. Her back is strong and her feet hold her upright. Jesus doing this on the Sabbath, among other healings that he did on the Sabbath, is meant to be a constant call and reminder to us that this is indeed our work as followers of Jesus Christ. It is worship to remove the yoke. It is praise to almighty God to help, help lift spirits that cripple and burden and press people down to the earth. It is good in God's sight when we loose the bonds of the captive, let the prisoner go free, that, that is giving glory to God in the highest, that is filled with the alleluias of the angels. And yet, and yet there are the voices that say, how dare you? How dare you do this in the context of worship? and scripture study. How dare you stop in the middle of a hymn and turn your attention to somebody who is being born over by the burdens of life? Jesus doesn't quote exactly from the passage in Isaiah that we read part of, but he could have. If you go back to the beginning of Isaiah 58, you will see the voice of condemnation. It starts, shout out, do not hold back. And God is calling out to the people of Israel who are more concerned with their own desires, with what they want with what they think is best and they have turned their eyes away from the commandment to love God and love neighbor. Instead, they come to worship so they can be seen making a big noise, which I hazard to guess was probably not particularly joyful. Because when, when we're focused on making a big noise ourselves, it's hard to feel the abandonment of joy. So God is calling them out and saying, this isn't what I want. What I want is for you to remove the yoke, to remove the things that bend people over, that press people down, that are burdens and boulders on shoulders and hearts and lives that mean, that mean God's abundance is is far, far away. And let's be clear, if God's abundance is far away from any person on this earth, it's not of God's doing. Oh, no, my friends, that, that's on us. That's on how we choose to hoard and keep and guard what God desires to be for all. And so the prophet Isaiah shouts out, he does not hold back, remove the yoke, remove the pointing of the finger and the speaking of evil. Do you wonder, do you wonder how many people blamed that woman for being bent over? It's because you didn't have good posture when you were a child. It's because you didn't make the right decisions. If only you had done this instead of that, 
things would have turned out differently. Have those words come from our mouths? I confess those thoughts have been in my heart. If they haven't come from my mouth, they've been what I've been taught. How many people pointed at that woman for 18 years and said, you brought this on yourself. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and it'll be okay. Trust in God. If you remove the yoke, Isaiah says, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, you don't deserve to be well. You don't deserve to thrive. What have you done that, that you should receive something more, that you should receive help? What have you done to deserve an extra bit of grace? Aren't those dangerous words? What have we done? to deserve the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We've done nothing. We don't deserve any of it. And yet we turn and we place those lenses of deserving on others who are just as beloved as God because they are also beloved children created in God's image. They also bear the stamp of Christ in their very flesh and blood. Isaiah says, remove the yoke, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil. Stop looking at people as if they should live lives of privation, struggle, difficulty. And instead, see, see how God's abundance can be spread far and wide so that the burdens, the boulders that that bend people over and press them down, may be lifted, which is our act of worship. If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, Isaiah says, then your light shall rise in the darkness. Your gloom shall be like the noonday. So here's the thing. When we, when we as followers of Jesus Christ add into our sense of worship, our sense of mission and discipleship, the breaking of these bonds, the driving away of the spirit that bends people over, when we understand that making sure there's affordable housing, that there's enough food for every person to have more than enough, not just a mouthful, but a feast. When we do the work to make sure that medical care is affordable and available, then our light shall rise. Our gloom shall be like the noonday. Then God will bless us, Isaiah says. Then our worship will be joyous and also pleasing to God. The other voice we sometimes hear when we talk about driving away these crippling spirits in worship is, well, now you're getting political. Now you're meddling. This is how the way things are. You're asking us to change that? This is church. We talk about God here. Do that somewhere else. Isn't that partly what the leader of the synagogue was saying to Jesus? There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. Don't talk about housing reform in the house of God. Don't talk about how our assistance systems in this country and in our communities will never be enough because they're designed to keep people in poverty and not to lift them up. Don't talk about that in worship. That, that's outside 
of what we come to God's house for. Do that on the other six days. Don't talk in worship about structural racism and how generations have been bowed down with the boulders that were placed on them without any opportunity to stand up and shrug them off. Don't talk about that. When we gather to sing hymns, that, that's for another day. That's for another place. This is church. Well, you hear Jesus. You hypocrites, ought not this woman, this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? What better day to break the bonds of poverty that shackle and press down so many people all around us. What better day to break apart the structures of racism that continue to keep people locked in places where thriving is out of the question. What better place to talk about food insecurity and housing insecurity and health insecurity and how children aren't receiving what they need to thrive in this world than right here, right here in the house of God, right here as followers of Jesus Christ, right here, asking for the spirit to show us the way. This, this is what worship looks like. It looks like digging into the vision God has for this world where every single person stands up tall, where all of those crippling spirits are banished, and every person knows abundant life, which is what Jesus promised. Here, here in worship is where we are strengthened to do that work because it's not just a worship day work either. It is, it is a 24 seven call to seek justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. It's not just for an hour or so one day a week. And it's not just outside of that hour or so. No, it is all that we are called to. And this is the vision. So I asked you to begin with me by imagining the physical sensation, the sinking stomach, the, the hurting and fractured heart, the weight on shoulders and back of having those spirits of poverty, racism, fragile health, uncertainty, bearing us down, broken dreams, shattered lives. Now I want you to imagine what the world will look like if we act more like Jesus. If we see those crippling, burdensome spirits for what they are, against God, against God's desires, against God's vision of kingdom for all. Isaiah gives us that image, that vision. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. The neighborhoods that are falling apart because of neglect, because of that pointing finger and the speaking of evil, they'll be beautiful. They'll be built into houses where children can play, where as we heard in the musical offering, where love will be our home, where there's laughter and joy. Your ancient ruins will be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. 
that impact of generational poverty and structural racism will be broken. There'll be no more. And from the bottom, everyone will be lifted up. The foundations of all will be of plenty, of hope, of dreams that flourish. And if my neighbor's dreams flourish, God knows my dreams flourish as well. If my neighbor has hope and joy, God knows my hope and joy is deeper and broader and wider. The foundations of many generations will be lifted up. You, you, Presbyterian Church in Sudbury, you, followers of Jesus Christ, shall be called repairers of the breach, drivers away of the spirits that bend people over and press them down. You will be known as the restorer of streets to live in. If that vision doesn't bring you joy, doesn't counteract that sense of, of burden and bending, being pressed over and forced down to the earth, if the vision of what could be if, if we began the work, if that doesn't compel you, to give it a try? I guess I don't know what will. This is what worship is meant to be. It's meant to be a place where we come together and break the bonds of injustice, remove the yoke that has been unfairly and generationally placed on the necks and backs of our neighbors, whom God has told us to love even as we love ourselves. My prayer, my hope is that you, my friends, you, will fulfill this word, that you will be known in Sudbury and the surrounding communities as those who have restored the breach, who have advocated for better policies, who have done the work to change the systems and structures so they lift up the foundations for many generations. That you, you will be doing the work to restore the streets that the kingdom of God might come. Oh, may God make it so. Amen.